This panel was inspired, obviously, by the title, by uh, the 2016 elections coming up. Uh, as you heard yesterday, as Senator Graham spoke to today, this is a heightened awareness period. Obviously, uh, our participation rates for young people and everyone increases during presidential elections. It's intuitive that there's obviously more political discourse. It's earlier political discourse. Many would argue sometimes too early. Many would argue the quantity far exceeding the quality going into it. Nonetheless, it is much more visible, and we see voter percentage rates increase for all groups, particularly for young people. However, there's a lot of variables out there. We've got a good panel here for you today, and I think a wonderful, wonderful panel to be able to bring you a great deal of experience to this. But most importantly, and our reason for bearing, being here, and David quite wise in doing this, in terms of including students, and I wish we had, had student participation more so, and I'm glad we do. It is good to get the students' inputs on this, to see what, what their opinions are, but to see what their ideas are, because I think they're just as valuable, they're absolutely just as valuable as, as, as they come to us. Uh, if I could introduce our, our, our panelists here for a moment. Unfortunately, our lead, our lead panelist, uh, Pinellas County Supervisor of Election, Deborah Clark, is not able to be here today. Uh, apparently, she has an election coming up on Tuesday. <laughs> Her canvassing board called for a meeting this morning, and unfortunately, she wasn't able to join us. Uh, she was, however, very kind in forwarding a lot of her information, which I'll share with you when, once, once I finish introducing everyone to you. Uh, first in the center is Dr. Nancy Thomas. Uh, Dr. Thomas is director of the Circle Initiative for Study of Higher Education and Public Life at Tufts University. Uh, Dr. Thomas is also going to be speaking to us at lunch today and sharing with us a lot of her research. Uh, she was acknowledged earlier this morning. I think we're very, very fortunate to have, 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 have Dr. Thomas with us here, not only at this panel, but at the conference. And, and thank you, Nancy. Thank you, Nancy, for being here. Uh, Dr. Tara Newsom. Uh, Dr. Tara Newsom is Associate Professor of Social and Behavioral Sciences and Director of the Center for Civic Learning and Community Engagement here in St. Petersburg College. Anybody who's spoken to Tara longer than three minutes knows the passion, the enthusiasm that she brings not only Maybe to this. Too much. Maybe too much. <laughs> <laughs> She's amazing. She's absolutely amazing what she brings to this. And if, if God, if, if my faculty, back, I can say this because I'm here, if my faculty at TCC had like 10% of this, it would be amazing. And I would love to, love to can it. I was so pleased to see Tara on this panel. Thank you. Thank you so much for your participation. Our student presenters here today, uh, to the extreme end, Jacob Grimm will be joining us here, Mr. Michael Hanlon, and Ms. Teresa Rodriguero. Thank you so much for being here and, and your, your, your participation in this. As I say, I think your input, absolutely just as valuable. This is the reason we're here. This is, I mean, this is why we, we, we have to initiate some change. So, so therefore, thank you for, for, for your participation. If I can just maybe set the stage a bit for this, and if I can use uh, uh, Ms. Clark's information, and I'll use her information. Uh, Deborah Clark compared Pinellas County with the rest of the state and the rest of the nation in terms of young people's participation. And I think it might help us set the stage so that our, our participants and our panelists here can, can actually expand and, and tell us a lot more about this. If you look, this is, she has compared 18 to 30 year olds and 18 to 29 year olds nationally from 2014 to 2012. I think uh, Ms. Clark would be very proud to say that Pinellas County is higher than the national, as you can see. However, they're not getting to the ballot box. We're not voting. That they, they simply, they're registering to vote, but they're not actually going to, to that, they're making that final step. And it's not actually due there. Uh, you can see the top line in terms of actually the traditional way, the way that every other generation has voted, a marked decrease in terms of that age group. However, what is also interesting, look at the indication of voting by mail, which actually is showing an increase. Uh, if, if we look at early voting, it's almost sporadic. And we know the political volleyball that's happened with early voting, and perhaps that's had an effect here, very predominantly in Florida, certainly. And we're not, you know, it, it's very, very difficult to see a measure there. But voting by mail, actually seeing an increase. And there may be a bit of a bit of hope here. Finally, voting by generation, 
as Senator Graham indicated, his generation, the silent generation, certainly having a huge, huge push here. Uh, you're seeing the split here dramatically. But you're also seeing that 18 to 29 year olds, absolutely this is the most, most problematic area. That the only way to be less likely to vote is to be incarcerated in prison. That you're not going to be able to get out there. To Obviously, they're not permitted to vote. 18 to 25 year olds, since they were given, as uh, Senator Graham given, since they were given the opportunity to vote, it has been a decrease ever since. And, and, and unfortunately, does not bode well for us. 2016 is an opportunity. We know we'll have an increase, but how much of an increase? How much of an increase among young people, uh, young, younger people? There's a lot of factors to look at here. There's disengagement from the political system. There's a very low trust in government. Uh, we saw some of that actually reflected yesterday, some of the comments. Obviously, the factor of civic engagement, how much, or civic education, how much civic education is being presented and how much is being done at the college level. These are all variables in terms of how 2016 is going to look. It will look better than, obviously, the last election, but how much better? A lot of variables to look at. And Nancy, given that, I will, I will certainly turn it over to, to your capable hands, and if you can expand on a few of those, it would be great. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Good morning. I assure you, you will be tired of me by the end of the day. Actually, by the halfway mark. <laughs> so I'm, I'm so happy to be here and so grateful to have um, such an amazing group of people dedicated to the things that I've been working on for a very long time. Um, but what you all are doing is different from what I'm doing because I'm studying it and you all are doing it. And I'm trying to study it in ways that will help you do it. And so that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. OK. So I work at Tufts University. I run an institute there called the Institute for Democracy in Higher Education, which was approved by the provost on Wednesday. I was hired to work with CIRCLE, which many of you probably know. CIRCLE is one of the foremost authorities on youth engagement and K-12. Uh, Peter Levine has been here many, many times and has worked with a lot of Florida legislators and educators to um, help civic learning at the K-12 level. I was brought in under the mandate of, gee, could we measure college student voting? And the whole idea was it really couldn't be done. And that's because it had never been done before. And because I figured out a way to do it and then expanded my team so much, Circle said, go, go forth. You are, you are too big and you are higher ed oriented. And so we are a spinoff. Think, think sitcoms. We are a spinoff of Circle, um, but literally just a few days old. Um, Tufts University is, housing, is home to uh, the Jonathan M. Tisch College of Citizenship which, uh, as many of you might know, is actually a college. And our dean sits at the same table as the arts and sciences dean, the med school dean, the veterinary school dean. And the idea behind Tisch College is that every student who graduates from Tufts University will have some citizenship education in their portfolio, no matter what level of study they're at, no matter what discipline. And then we're also home to the Talwars Network, which is an international consortium of colleges and universities around the globe who are committed to civic learning and engagement. So what does uh, this brand new institute do? Well, it does what it's been doing for the last three years, which is we do a lot of research, and then we're going to put together some resources for you all, and some of them are already available. And then we're also doing some neat convening. Every summer we run a conference called Frontiers of Democracy. It's actually been around in one form or another since 2007. And it consists of civic leaders and academics who come together and talk about the state of American democracy and what needs to happen. Um, it's, a f it's a fabulous com conference if you ever can make your way up to New England. It happens the last week of June. Um, and then the other thing that we are going to be looking at is political inequality, which we think is pretty serious in this nation. Um, and I think uh, Senator Graham 
stated it pretty well when he said people who vote have power and people who don't vote do not have power. And therefore, if you vote, you will have power. That's, that is true. The problem is that's not so easy. There are lots of reasons why people don't vote, and they do not necessarily mean that they don't want to vote. And so we need to figure out ways to empower people beyond voting, but also, of course, in including voting. So what we're best known for right this minute is, is NSOLV, which is the National Study of Learning, Voting, and Engagement. And I bet most of your campuses, if not all of you, are set up on NSOLV. It is a free service that we offer to every college and university in the country. It, uh, if you sign up, you do not have to run a survey, you do not have to do anything other than sign a, an authorization form. If you sign up, in some period of time, depending on when we get our records in, you will receive a tidy little report that tells you what's in this slide. So it will tell you how many of your students registered, how many actually voted, and then the registration rate. What's your yield of the people who registered and then voted? And we now have data for 2012 and 2014, and the 2014 data is going out to colleges today. So it's been a big week, and this is, we have, um, when we started the project, we were hoping to get 125 campuses in the study so that we could perhaps put together a representative sample and do some neat research. And we now, uh, about two, we started in 2013, um, in about two and a half years, we now have 790 colleges and universities nationally. In the study, we have uh, student records over seven million of them. So that gives us a pretty hefty database from which to do some really nice research. And we are grateful, very, very grateful, to the colleges and universities that sign up. I have heard every excuse in the book for not signing up. And they range from, I'm afraid our voting rates will get known, to, I don't care about voting. And I had one person say, well, we're applying for the Carnegie classification for the engaged scholarship. Uh, and if we have low voting rates, we, we worry we won't get it. It's free. It's easy. It's good data. Do it. Um, so our data is a little bit, it's pretty consistent with some of the things you've already heard today. Um, our students, let me see, I gotta get you that slide. So one thing that's really interesting about voting is there is no official tally. The federal government does not calculate voting rates. And in fact, it's very hard to do because there is no official count of non-citizens in this country. So all voting rates that you hear are estimates and these estimates can be skewed by the number of people in your, in your geographic area or on your campus who are not eligible to vote. And that can be international students. It can also be undocumented students. Um, so you do have to take, you sort of have to adjust in your head some of these numbers based on where you're located. We have found that in the border states and large urban areas like New York, the campuses have to adjust their voting rates to accommodate undocumented students. Um, but CPS data said that students voted at 55.9%, 18 to 29 year olds. And in 2014, it's about 19%. And our data, the, this actually is circle data, and our data from Circle says that the voting rate for 18 to 29 year olds in 2014 is the lowest since 18-year-olds got the right to vote. So while Senator Graham said that there's a little bump up, our data shows there's a, little, there's a bump down. And I think the difference might be Florida because Florida is actually better than the rest, of the rest of the nation, which is nice. Our college student voting data, set, and I should explain to you how we do it, we get enrollment records from the National Student Clearinghouse. Each of your institutions give the, re the records to the clearinghouse, and that's a really nice repository. You give permission then 
for the clearinghouse to have imported voting records, which we purchase from a company that collects them. And so we have actual enrollment records and actual voting records, unlike um, CPS, which is based on a survey. Our uh, data is the only data that is based on actual voting records. I think that's going to start changing, but for right now, we've got the scoop. And um, we are at 41.6 for college students in 2012 and 13.9 for 2014. So our numbers are actual numbers and they are low. Um, I thought I would share with you Florida. Um, these are based on our Florida campuses, and at the time that we did these calculations, that was 35 campuses. You have quite a bit more than that, and so these are not voting rates for college students in Florida. These are voting rates for college students among our 35 campuses. And um, as you can see, they are significantly higher than the rates of our other students across the state. So you all are doing something well, uh, something right, and uh, doing it well, and that's, that's great to see. Okay, so what happens to us is we're constantly being asked, okay, our voting rates are low, what do we do? And so we did something with our data that's pretty exciting, and that is we identified the indicators of voting through a regression model, and then taking that regression and sort of flipping it, we calculated for each campus a predicted voting rate. So if your voting rate that we give you through NSOLVE is 55, but we predicted you to be at 45, that's really good. One of the problems is campuses can't really compare with each other. It's not, it's not a great comparison. You all serve different students. It's, it's, it's not fair, really, to measure your rates against somebody else, some other community college. What's really better is if you could measure it against your own performance. And so we are working on ways to get you that data, but for right now, we use it just for research purposes. And we have about 40 campuses um, probably about 90 now, but 40 uh, when we first started this research that we identified it have, as having blown out of the ball ballpark voting rates. So they were performing at way higher than we predicted. And we were able to get money to go visit them. And so we did a study of these campuses with very high voting rates. We got funding for five campuses and we now have funding to do four more, and so we're hitting the road again. This is a qualitative study, and it looks at, hang on, uh, it looks at campus climate. So we're looking at what is the climate of an institution with way, way, way high voting rates. And our theory is that voting is a proxy for other forms of political engagement. Okay, so what I'm gonna share with you now, and I'm gonna try and do it quickly so we have time for everybody, um, I'm gonna share with you some of our top line findings. And these are being published, you know, you have to perish if you don't do this in peer review and they take forever. So we're trying to figure out a way to get this all out, but this is a scoop, you all, this, I've never done this before. So I'm very happy to share with you our top, top line findings. Okay, so number one, on our campuses, there is a deep sense of shared responsibility. Now, that's different from shared governance. Now, shared governance is important too, but shared responsibility is one of the key attributes of these amazing campuses. And I'll give you a few examples. So I have in the, on the slide this tenancy in common. I have a law degree, and so I think like a lawyer sometimes. I know I'm trying to get out of it, but it just happens. And there is something in the law called tenants in common versus joint tenancy, okay? And one of them, if you can imagine a circle with lots and lots and lots of pieces of the pie, that's one form where each of us owns a piece of a pie. Let's say it's a piece of property or just responsibility for the whole. Tenants in common is different. It means everything is shared. You don't own your piece of the pie. We both own your piece of the pie. We are jointly responsible for your piece of the pie and my piece of the pie. And that's a very different mindset 
than what you normally find in higher education. What you find are silos. What you find are disciplinary hubs. What you find is allegiance to a discipline. On these campuses, that wasn't what was happening. The biggest thing was that the faculty oozed caring. They let these students know all the time, we care about you, we care about your well-being, we care about your development, we care about you in, as a whole. And this, this quote in here by a student, my professor, or this is actually by a faculty talking about uh, students, my professor knows me, my, he knows my name, she knows, she cares about me. A couple of really cool programs. Um, these are pseudonyms, You Care and Agents of Change, because we couldn't, um, we kept the campuses confidential. But for Agents of Change, three faculty members, including the woman who runs the Teaching and Learning Center at the institution, made the decision that they were going to self-study white privilege. And they got together regularly. They brought in people to do training. They studied how they were managing their white privilege. They then put a little sign on their door that said, Agents of Change. And that was a signal to the students that we are going to try to do things a little bit differently here. We're going to look at things through the lens of equality and opportunity. And over time, the faculty, other faculty members walked by and said, why do you have so many students in here? And what are you doing? And they learned. And over time, 85, currently 85 to 90, I we heard two different numbers when we were there. Faculty members are now agents of change. And every time a committee is set up on campus, the pr people who are forming it say, wait a minute, wait a minute, how many agents of change do we have on this committee? That's really cool. Another one, which is a, uh, also a pseudonym, is You Care. This campus had a suicide about eight years ago, and they didn't want that. Uh, that blows me away because at the research university, suicides are not that uncommon. But this campus was completely freaked out because they had won eight years ago. And they said, this will never, ever happen again on our campus. And they started something called You Care. And this little comment bubble is on every door, on every bathroom store, stool, uh, blah, 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 every bathroom door, every regular door. And all of the um, students are trained, and all of the faculty are trained to make sure no one falls through the cracks. So what happened then was some student was caught sleeping on a couch. It, they figured out the student was homeless. They put together a food bank and diapers, and it's all donated by faculty. The woman who runs it says, that I never, ever have to ask for anything. This place is always stocked. And if somebody is, is living in their car, they have dorm rooms set aside. They have several set aside for the emergency student that's living in the dorm. And if somebody's living in their car, they can't afford their books. They may not be eating. So this UCARE program is everywhere, and it is what the institution does. It's how they operate. So that's one really big key finding. Um, another one has to do with leadership training, and that has come up a number of times already today about um, some of the programs that we've heard on, on uh, this campus and others. So leadership is a big thing on these campuses, but I'm not talking about studying best practices in leadership. I'm talking about doing it. On these campuses, students serve on all the key committees. They serve on key academic committees. They make funding decisions. On one campus we visited, they own a building. And the building includes the cafeteria, the bookstore, the student union, classrooms, and offices, and the administration doesn't even have a key. They run it all. They are responsible for it. They are held accountable for it. It's run through the student government. And yet it's also not positional authority. This is one of the things that was very interesting. And I loved this about one of the campuses. There was one campus we visited where the students are complete and utter political animals. 
and they are unbelievable. So they, they do the right thing, but then they also know what to do with it. And when Nelson Mandela was dying, they decided to hold a campus vigil. Within 10 minutes, they had 450 people out there holding candles. Within 20 minutes, they had members of the media there, and within 30 minutes, they had politicians there holding candles. They knew exactly how to do this. They knew that it would be exciting for students to be there with the media. They knew that the media would want the photo op. They knew that the politicians would want the photo op. And they also really wanted to have a vigil for Nelson Mandela. And it lasted until he passed away. This is the kind of thing that's going on on these campuses around leadership. Protest all the time. All the time. But it's respected. And it's usually over a lack of transparency. And if there's a protest, we were on a campus when the students started protesting the firing of a faculty member. President comes right down the stairs, sits down with the students, says, what's the problem? Students say, why'd you fire this faculty member? He said, well, I've got confidentiality problems. I'm not really allowed to disclose. But let me tell you the reasons why we do fire faculty members. And within 20 minutes, the students were OK. OK, that was a reasonable decision. Next time, tell us first. <laughs> Another thing, embedded political discourse. And I mean in the DNA. Society is used as text. Composition and first year experiences revolve around uh, public issues, current events. It, this is also a very nuanced uh, finding because these students don't just come in and hash it out. They're actually trained the arts of democracy. They learn how to frame issues. They learn how to facilitate conversations. They learn how to write an argument. Um, I love the quote from one of my faculty members who said, we do this all through a composition class and there is not a piece of literature to be found. Um, it, it is, uh, it's fascinating because they take difference uh, social identity difference, difference in ideology, difference in religion, and they turn it into an educational opportunity. It's what they talk about. And yet, at the end of the day, respect prevails and finding common ground prevails. So these students learn how to talk to each other, how to disagree, and how to leave a disagreement as friends. And it's part, it's literally, one of the campuses ha does this in a composition class that is optional. 85% of the students take it. Um, I love the, qu the quote by Max Favor that um, Gene Rice at AACNU often uses where he says it's the role of the, of the faculty member to ask the inconvenient questions. We found that all the time. We called it playing devil's advocate. But faculty need to get out of roles. They have to set aside their own opinions. They need to make sure all perspectives in the room are heard. And at least in New England, it's very, very, very common for classrooms to be made up of one leaning, one political ideology. And a lot of faculty members are, are liberal in certain disciplines. The, it is a myth that college faculty members are liberal. It depends on the discipline. There are many, many disciplines where they are extremely conservative. Either way, they really need to pitch both sides of the story, and they need to play devil's advocate in both directions. Um, this, this then gets into the arts of discussion-based teaching, which we found on all of these campuses. Um, it is an art. It is something that is not taught in graduate school to PhDs. Uh, everybody know who this guy is? Everybody in New England knows who this guy is, <laughs> Paul Revere. <laughs> so Paul Revere went north, and Bill Dawes went south, and Paul Revere got out the troops, and Bill Dawes didn't. And it's because Paul Revere, Revere was super socially connected. He knew who his networks were. He hung out in bars. He was a, he was a really popular guy. On all of our campuses, 
everybody knows who the key people are and they know how they're connected and they are extremely intentional about understanding the connections because not only will these help you mobilize 450 students for a vigil, but it will also identify your levers of change on campus. So if you want to change your campus climate, you got to know your social connectivity. <coughs> Physical spaces, enormous, absolutely enormous. Um, I love the picture down at the bottom, but it's quite old. Faculty offices are physical spaces for political discourse, social connectivity, leadership development, and so forth. Um, free speech walls are very popular right now. I, I have mixed feelings about them. I think it's really great to have them as long as it's totally clear that it's not the only place free speech happens. Okay, and that's I think the myth. And so you hear these people, oh, they're quashing speech by putting up a speech wall. No, 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 they're providing a venue for it. But don't provide a venue and then say it's not allowed across campus. Um, the big picture with all the tables, that I believe is the Jacob Javits Center where America Speaks used to do its, its things. And uh, though they were massive dialogues with uplinks and downlinks and absolutely fabulous for policy making. This particular dialogue, I believe, was on what to do with the uh, location where the World Trade Center buildings had once been. Champions. That's Bev Tatum on the right. She's a little blurry, I'll have to fix that. She's the president of Spelman College. And she told me once, I'd like to be president, but what I really am is a civil rights activist. And on our campuses, the presidents were activists. Not all of them, not all of them. And by the way, not all of the campuses had every one of these attributes, but they had some kind of composite. Um, creating a buzz. That's really a student thing. These students were really good at creating a buzz, and I mentioned one campus that did it, but it happened everywhere. One of the things um, we found was that get out the vote stuff was not all that important because all the campuses do that. What was really important was politics 365, so that when you do talk politics, you do mobilize voters, you, it's not a reach. It's not that hard to do. So we are all in favor of get out the vote efforts and we're all in favor of things like turbo vote, which I think is fabulous, but it removes barriers for students. It doesn't cause them to vote. And finally, nimbleness. Your institutions need to be able to roll with it. And I think with that, I'll end with the punchline, which is, it's messy out there. All of these things could be one of your little points, and they all connect, and they intersect and interact, and they are dependent on people, and it's complicated. So with that, I will stop and turn it over to Tara. Yes, thanks. Okay. I'm going to take this conversation to the next action-orientated step. Um, first off, I'm so delighted to be um, up uh, here with, uh, oh, my mic. Can you hear me? I'm so sorry. Be delighted to be up here with um, not only our students at SBC, but with Nancy and with Rick, I think, and all of you to take a moment out of our Friday to, to talk about civic engagement. Uh, what I'm gonna speak on is student engagement and the diverse ways that we can connect with students. And there's a lot of pathways from Nancy's discussion and Senator Graham's discussion this morning that will take us into the action items of what you can take away from this discussion and how you can take that back to your institution. Um, yesterday, a colleague of mine who's sitting in the audience, uh, Suzanne Preston, and I were talking about the differences between the 28 college system and the university system. And there are a lot of differences. And I just wanted to take a moment to say those differences include something called, uh, what she coined, civic development. And as I was thinking about civic development last night, I was thinking about scaffolding and how you hear about scaffolding between the K through 12 system. And that's something that the 28 college system has to do to grow into some of the successes that Nancy has really talked about on the university level and college level outside of the state of Florida is something where we have to bring along civic literacy. 
And so a lot of what I'm talking about today is how we can bring along civic literacy and that sort of civic development to ultimately manifest into a vote, right, which is one of the ultimate ways that we engage in society. Now, forgive me, I can't help myself, but this is a picture of chariots of fire, okay? And the reason I put it up there is because, like Nancy, I believe that we are all champions of the civic movement. And we have to have institutional champions. We have to have champions like Senator Graham, uh, our presidents, our deans, our chairs. And we as faculty and as individuals need to be champions of the civic movement. And my kids said, don't put the, don't put the music in there too, because no one will remember it. But you can at least hear it in your head. And, and I have to say that I couldn't help but move on to then say, if we're champions, how did we get here? We got here because we were inspired. And when we leave here today, we have to go home and not be fatigued and continue to inspire our students through our activities, as diverse of activities as we are. And so I would like to just play this just for just one second, indulge me, because do we have- I come here tonight and plead with you. Believe in yourself and believe that you're somebody. And as I said to a group last night, Nobody else can do this for us. No document can do this for us. No Lincolnian Emancipation Proclamation can do this for us. No Kennesonian or Johnsonian Civil Rights Bill can do this for us. If the Negro is to be free, he must move down into the inner resources of his own soul and sign with a pen and ink of self-assertive manhood his own emancipation proclamation. And the revolution within ourselves has to be bred within our students, and that doesn't have to look like anarchy. It has to be uh, uh, that catalyst within ourselves. And so as we talk about civic engagement, we talk about activating our students to end up voting, we have to build their civic literacy, scaffold them from some of our students in the 28 college systems have never been in a household with anyone that's voted. They've never seen anyone read the paper, sit around the dinner table and discuss. And so this revolution has to come, I think, from the faculty and from the institutions to teach those basic citizenship values. Now, we're up against something, right? We have to talk about the barrier, the elephant in the room, which is the ugliness of politics, right? And so you cannot talk about civic engagement without talking about the barriers that our students look at before they, they turn off. They don't engage because they're bombarded by these, this type of messaging, right? So as we talk about civic engagement, we have to recognize that there's a lot of barriers that students want to disengage. They, won't, they don't want to vote, not just because they don't know about voting. They don't want to vote because all of the messaging that they get in, in their di informational diet is, is ugly in their, in their minds. Now, let's shift a little bit and talk about the traditional methods of civic engagement, which then lead us to voting. You know, Nancy said it best, these traditional methods are great. You know, the, the day that you have campus debates, the speakers bureaus, the, um, the different methods in which we traditionally have engaged students having registered uh, the League of Women Voters or the, the Supervisor of Elections to register voters, TurboVote, which is a wonderful tool. Those are all great methods that we need to continue in our informational diet. It's like eating the five to nine fruits and vegetables. We can't take those off the plate. Okay, so those are important in terms of getting to 2016 and engaging. But we don't want to just talk about getting to 2016 and engaging the voter. We want to talk about creating a sustainable citizen, right? 2016 is just one indicator of that. Okay, but we're trying to go from 25 years of a generation who's never had civic engagement to making it a value that they'll be engaged in the community beyond citizenship. So traditional methods are great, but then I think what we need to start looking at ways that we can reach a, a student where they are. If a student isn't necessarily going to uh, vote because they don't feel connected to the topic, we need to bring the topic to them that they're interested in. Um, uh, one of our faculty member uh, here at SPC launched the Citizen Ambassador Initiative. And that allowed for citizens, or for students, I'm sorry, to see themselves as part of the national discussion about immigration. So rather than asking them to vote, we asked them to get involved in the issue. We asked them to mentor and be a citizen ambassador to those that are seeking citizenship. 
all of a sudden, that wasn't so far away, that was right here on campus, and they could connect to that ac activity. And then when they go to vote, they have a participated in a solution. How many people like here want to be part of something that actually works and part of a solution? We all do. So when you can actually put yourself in that, in that piece, it, it's really effective for students to be engaged. We also have a number of uh, students that um, are part of a community dialogue regarding our failing school systems. Uh, we don't have the time to talk about how awful that is, but we do have the time to talk about how if we ask our students to be mentors to help solve the problem, they see themselves as engaged in local problems and, lo and being part of the local solution. Now, that's not voting. That's not traditional civic engagement. That's asking them to serve their community and be a part of a solution. That scaffolding leads to voting. It leads to service. It leads to wanting to be on a city council committee. It leads to participating in other civic activities. And the final ex um, example I wanted to include is engaging students in career readiness activities that have a civic engagement component. We're the 28 college system. Our, our state legislature has asked us to create career ready individuals. That does not mean that we have to set aside our goals to connect citizen development. That means there's a very easy pathway to have them together, and that is to allow students, as diverse as they are, to find uh, careers that speak to their heart, to serve in those areas, and then that leads to networking, career development, skill building, and then a sustainable service to the community, an area that they specifically have an interest in and a commitment to. So if you ask a student to go in and volunteer somewhere at a soup kitchen, but they don't really have any interest in that, but then you ask them to go serve, as I was talking to someone the other day about um, individuals that are accountants that come through and have a requirement of service. Well, they can go and serve as a, as a you know, a bookkeeper for a, a local community organization, and all of a sudden they're serving a nonprofit organization, but in an area that isn't terribly, you know, thought of as a place of service, a bookkeeping. But but. Translate that across disciplines. Okay, these are just examples. Um, at SBC, we're lucky that we have institutional champions. Our president is a champion, our deans are champions, our staff and our, our faculty are champions. And they look at ways and in their discipline where they can engage the student. And so it's gonna look different for every single faculty member, for every single different department, and that should be celebrated. And so if you walk out of here today and you say, you know, I didn't see any examples that speak to me, but let me think of it. Get on Campus Compact's website. Look at activities that can speak to how you, you're teaching pedagogy, your academic integrity, and then try to build that into your discipline, and then try to breed that across your college. Now, Nancy's right. Uh, we don't call it um, free speech walls, but we call them democracy walls. And they, they are a low-tech option for many of us that have budget issues. Now, the reason I put it on here as a form of uh, engagement, and I knew that Nancy had hers on there, was because I think there's something incredibly important about the visceral experience that students have with civic engagement. What, what do I mean by that? I mean, when a student has to pick up a piece of chalk or a, or a pen, and they have to write down what they think, that means they have to look at what the question is, they have to look at other people's ideas, and then they have to commit to it. Believe it or not, that commitment, that visceral experience of doing it, all of a sudden turns them on. Because all of a sudden, they see their words next to their colleagues' words, next to their peers' words, next to their provost's words, and they see they're all part of the same conversation and they all have value. That not one person has more value than another. So that visceral experience is incredibly powerful, especially for most of our colleges and campuses that are, are more challenged by um, resources and that individuals uh, don't actually have the opportunity often to be next to uh, decision makers. Now, something that we're going to start trying uh, is something as low-tech as the soapbox. Mm -hmm. Now listen, this is, this is not the technology of TurboVote, okay? This is not the beautiful technology that many of our universities have. And I celebrate those, that technology, and I hope to God they share it with us so we can use it. But there's something very powerful that brought everybody in this room to civics. And that civics is exactly what Dr. Uh, or Senator Graham said, it's not civics. It's engagement. It's your own personhood sharing with your community. And the soapbox, you know, is one of those places that you can finally stand up and, and actually share with your community your thoughts and then see somebody else stand up and think about their thoughts and then have that discourse in a civil way that creates pluralism, right? The competition of ideas, which is the very basis of citizenship. 
Now, another piece that we're going to be trying that's sort of an alternative civic engagement is is looking at disciplines that are actually a very easy pathway. Now, St. Pete College is committed to every discipline finding a way to engage civic development. But one of the ways that I think that um, speaks to our community, and you have to think about your community, but our community at St. Pete is, is really committed to the arts. Okay, we've developed a whole industry, a whole community based upon the arts. Looking at that and looking at where our college sits, the opportunity to have the art as a pathway of civic expression is very easy for us. It draws the community in. It also uses a medium that our students and a modality that they understand, right? This is graphic arts. Students can understand this. They can identify with this. This is their language. And so we're going to couple that with the mural art movement. And now, believe it or not, this campus in Seminole is going to have a mural art on it. We're going, to have, we're going to have mural art across all of our campuses. And they're going to be expressions of civic commitment. They don't all, they're not going to all look the same because each campus is located in a different place. This is just a, and I'm sorry, this is a, this is a mural that's already located in, in St. Pete. But these mural artists are part of the cachet of artists that are going to be uh, collaborating with our students and our administration to figure out what kind of art speaks to the community where that college, that doesn't look like traditional civic engagement, but you know what, that's a sustainable, very visible signal to students and the community that we want to have a conversation about lots of different issues and that this is a place to do that and that we celebrate that. And I'm almost done, almost done, I'm almost done. Or just like, get done. That, this is, a, this is a mural art that's in downtown St. Pete. And the concept here is, is the really, I want to take you back and leave you with this. Civic engagement has to be as diverse as our students. It, it cannot look the same way for every one of us. We have to be creative. We have to be innovative. We cannot be afraid of the things that we have to measure, and we cannot be afraid of the things that we cannot measure. And we have to think about ourselves being champions, how we were inspired, and then take that out of here and inspire our students and our community to become lifelong individuals of servants. Thank you. Okay, now I think I, think I have a second role. And the second role that I have is that I get to facilitate our students, who I am extremely appreciative of you being here, because it's not only important for us to have the dialogue of what the numbers tell us uh, that reveals uh, voting and civic engagement about the anecdotal piece of how we can continue to engage our students, but, but what better place than to have our students reflect upon what has actually brought them to the table of civic engagement, what, depending on their diverse background, how they ended up being engaged as a student, as a citizen. And so what I'd like to do is start with Teresa. And I'm going to turn mine off and you turn yours on. And I'd like to ask Teresa, um, as a student SBC and as a student who, who you know, has a lot of different things on your shoulders, how is it and what are the factors that have really brought you into engagement? And if you could share as much as you're comfortable with kind of the, your demographic, who you are, and then how that led you to engagement. Okay. Um, so I come from a small town. and. In that small town, there were issues that were brought up, um, you know, school board is issues. Um, my father was a member of the Chamber of Commerce, so I was always aware of these issues. You know, he would discuss them at the dinner table. So myself and my two older brothers and younger sister always had knowledge that there was things going on in the community. Um, he had us participate in community events, we used to volunteer because he knew what was going on, so he'd bring us. He'd um, help with a food drive during Thanksgiving and so forth, so I could see what we were doing, the impact it was having on the community. Um, I was brought up with that, that concept of, of helping and what you do does make a difference and what you have to say does make a difference. Being in a small town where, you know, they're trying to pass a levy to get a new high school built, you see that every person's vote does count. So coming forward with that perspective, now being a mother of two small children, I want to make sure that my children know that their opinion and that doing things in their community does make a difference. I want them to um, take an active role growing up in, in volunteering and you know whatever they become passionate about as they get older, finding something to um, participate in that helps make a change and, and make a difference. Um, you know, that's 
basically. Do you think that there was anything on campus that generated uh, continued engagement? Can you think of anything specific? Well, I was actually talking to uh, my professor. When I was in hygiene school, I graduated several years ago, but um, one of the requirements in hygiene school is you take two semesters of community where you are required to go out into the community to schools. Um, there's a, a developmentally challenged school that you go spend time at um, talking to younger children about, you know, obviously the subject which we are teaching, but um, it, it put us out there and made us take a look at what was around us. And, um, you know, there was 35 students in our class and all of us got something out of it in terms of making a difference and, um, you know, as much as I can say during the time, it was, it was you know, time consuming, I guess you would say, to have to go out and do this, but when ref I reflect back, on it, um, it was an experience that gave me so much. And you know, now in my profession, I can go and do things comfortably that are outside my comfort zone. And when they were discussing downstairs about that being a required class, for me, as a student, I go, okay, that's another class I have to take. But as somebody that wants people to care about what's going on and know that their voice has a, has a matters and so forth, to be required to take a class like that would benefit everyone. I mean, right. our professor makes us, as part of our, um, this semester, part of our government is to go out and do that. And that's, aside from my own specialty, that's the first professor that I've had that says, go do something, right. you know? And see yourself in the community. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. Michael. Can you share some of the experiences that you've had? And you know, these are academicians. These are folks who want to know from students. What can they do to breed more civic engagement? Can you share anything that might help them? Can you expand on the question? Sure. What has, what has, sure. What, what has been one of the components that have generated your interest in engagement and community? So you're, you're, tell us about your student, your student club and your participation as and civic engagement on campus? I'm not really civically engaged on campus. I, when I first came to this to uh, Simbi College, I wanted to get involved in SGA. And I went to the SGA table at the welcoming party and I talked to the student body president at the time. And I said, how can I get involved in SGA? She basically just handed me a piece of paper and that was it. Didn't talk to me about anything else. And that really turned me off about getting involved in the school. So. What I think is that when you have an SGA president, you have to tell them to, you have to be outgoing. You have to basically be a politician, go to every student, shake their hand, get to know who they are. And that's really it. I mean, besides when you do get out to vote on campus, it's usually every four years. Now, presidential elections are important, but the more important ones are actually for Congress and the State House. You should be doing, instead of every four years, you should be doing every two years. And the only reason presidential campaigns are more popular than congressional is because they don't make it to the mainstream media. They're more local. So what I think is that you should probably bring the candidates to the school and have them basically have them here all day in the lobbies, huh. meeting the students and basically getting them not out to vote meeting the candidate so they they know what the candidate stands for they know who they are they can actually say oh i met so and so i met david jolly i met charlie christ and that's basically it. greater access yes so, and it's not just that oh i saw the guy in bay news nine it's no i shook his hand and he actually took the time out of his day to talk to me about why social security or student debt things of that nature so okay Okay, thank you, Michael. Now, Jacob, you're a student and you're at, at SBC, you're at Clearwater Campus. Correct, yes. And so tell us a little bit about your experience in student engagement. All right, so I'm an early college student at the Clearwater Campus of SPC, and I have a, um, I'm also engaged in my high school since early college is a program that allows me to do my AA degree while I finish my last two years of high school. Um, and for me, what got me turned on to civil engage, uh, civic engagement was initially my mother having me do lots of different volunteer activities at a young age, and she really uh, got that impression into me and my brother about helping out in your community and contributing and giving back to it. And that later um, 
showed when I went to uh, Plato Academy Middle School, and I had the opportunity to be student government president of the eighth grade student council. But the teacher I had in eighth grade who taught us about um, civics, which I think was, as um, our senator mentioned previously, uh, a re, re trying to bring back um, the teaching of civics and something like that, she was teaching us some of that stuff. And there was cool programs like iCivics and different websites that made it fun and enjoyable for us that got us interested in it. So she was so passionate about the issue herself that she inspired me and our students to do that. And so we had actual meetings between our students about issues in the hallway, whether it was about like why is there gum on the lockers to where we should put them and how we should have things organized. Um, but uh, one of the ways that I've had it uh, incorporated in my, le uh, my classes at SBC is, um, as Teresa mentioned, um, our wondrous professor, uh, Ms. Preston over there, uh, incorporated into our student, our, our na uh, American national government class, a component where we have to get active in our community. And I was part of the grade and everything, and I was totally for us. I was like, oh, this looks fantastic. And one of the things, uh, the project that I got to be a part of was Junior Achievement, which is a program where you go to elementary school or some level of grading, and you teach about their role in their community or the government or so on. And it's a fantastic opportunity for us to understand it better and to pass it on because as you see, once you get into the 18 to 29 about age range, you have people that are less interested, less educated about it. So if they start up with it and they are just building on it as they grow up, they're going to be ready when the time comes. The, the students need to feel like they matter in, um, or that they have something that ties them to it in the community. And as you said, um, one of the campuses, they had embedded political discourse. So, if you have it set up and like continually where students are engaged or interested or help are helping out, then it's going to be second nature when you try and start something or do something. And that's really, a, I think, a great way to have it. Thank you, Jacob. Mm -hmm. uh, David, we, we got a bit of a late, late start, but do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, do, do you have questions of the students or any of the panelists? Yes, ma'am. I think it's Alien. Are you familiar with Alien? It's an app where young people are tapping into group, groups of youth, youth groups, mm. and they're talking about politics and they're talking about all of these things. Now, I'm politically engaged and I am a member of different Facebook uh, groups, and I'm thrilled to be engaging with people your age. Yeah. And I tell them, well, I'm a college professor, I'm 54, and that's all I say, and they don't mind me, and they, I'm okay. <laughs> And I tell them how cool their pictures are with a t-shirt of my candidate of choice. And what else is going on in terms of youth? Because I know I can see it every day because I go into Facebook and into these groups. And I see a lot of young people, millennials, signing up and taking pictures with their candidates. This candidate, I won't mention the name, of course. But uh, what do you see in terms of social media? Because I know that it plays a very important role in your lives, in my children's life. And what are you doing? What's going on in that arena in terms of civic engagement? All right. Well, um, as you said, social media is a very large component, um, especially of the younger generation's lives as we grow into the computer age. And um, it, it plays um, as a, like a medium for us to express our views and get out information and also constantly remind people about being engaged and doing different things. So it's um, when you have that, kind of constant reminder in your environment or in something that you check as simple as Facebook every day. Uh, it kind of helps you keep on it. And as I said, it's, it's something that's always there that is continually keeping the interest in. Um, things that we do with that, uh, I'd have to say like, um, initially I was playing myself as soon as I get that, uh, as soon as I have the opportunity to vote, uh, I get that sticker I'm gonna be like posting on Facebook. Hey, uh, just voted, encouraging everyone else to go out and do it. and. Um, I'm looking at getting my officers at high school to start pushing my friends because all of us, all my, um, all my friends and associates I know are going to be set up and ready for this next election. So I wanted to try and make a large push, whether it be through social media or through um, activity groups at the college or high school level, to facilitate it and change that um, 
lowering statistic and have it rise as high as possible. Michael, Teresa? <laughs> The only thing I wanted to add to that is in regards to those of, there are some people that are aware of voting and so forth, but something that should be done on social media is making it more um, accessible as to how to vote. You know, some people don't even know where to go. They don't even know how to register. They don't even know, you know, I have to work at I, I have kids. I am a single mom. I take them to school in the morning. I'll go straight to work. I leave work. I pick them up, and that's my day. So, you know, finding that time in the day to vote. But there are, you know, you can do early voting. You can get voting through the mail. So it's, those things need to be made um, present, or people need to know that those things are available so that they can do them. It's It's something that young people don't know about. You know, I found out about it because my parents were doing it when they were traveling. And um, I think that's something that on social media and other avenues, even on, you know, the websites for the schools and stuff that you went through the turbo vote and whatnot, that they can let younger kids know you can use these tools so that you still have a, a voice in what's going on. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Yes, sir. Give David a chance to get to you. Nancy, this is a quick question for you, and you, you may already be doing this, but uh, we're, we're, this conference is talking about the Florida college system, which is about 800,000 students. And the average age in the associate degree programs is like 29, and the average age in our bachelor's programs is 38. So I kind of missed the demographic on the chart. Are, are you going to look at... And, we're, and yesterday we talked about collecting data to show outcomes with civic engagement. Is, is Tufts going to look at the community college system as a system in our own demographics and have information on that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when yeah, there, we need to know that too, but we need yeah. to have our... You know. Yeah. So there are a couple of things. First of all, every campus that signs up for our study gets an individualized report. And in addition to the broad data that I showed earlier on the slide, uh, there are multiple pages in that report, and we break the data down by uh, gender, race, ethnicity, uh, age. Um, we look at whether students voted in state or out of state. We look at voting method, absentee ballot, and we provide all of that data to each participating institution. It's really a, a nifty, it's a nifty service. Um, for systems, if an entire system signs up, we are intending to send a system report to someone. Um, we are not there yet. We're, we're, this is, I, we have such a tiger by the tail. Uh, so I know that the system here is signed up, and we are going to be getting the system a report. I think it'll go to David. Um, and we have a, a lot of systems now are signing up because they want, they want those reports. Um, bear in mind that the, if, if, we, if we don't have good data, we can't give you good data. And a lot of campuses cut corners on the data that they give to the National Student Clearinghouse. So for example, they don't include race, they don't include gender. You don't include it, we can't get it. So for the next five years or so, we're on a big info campaign to get, to get the data cleaned up. Um, I, can I make one comment about the, the the, the social media that I think is really in line. I think a lot of people, particularly uh, my age, worry that social media is a form of disengagement. And I think that's a mistake. I think we have to meet students where they are. And I think we've got to figure out ways to engage them where they are, as opposed to insisting that they play by our rules all the time. Now that said, we're experimenting with something called text talk vote which is a form of uh, a sort of a spin-off of Text Talk Act, which you can look up on the internet. Um, and the, it's a dialogue process that uses phones and texting. And students get in small groups, and they're asked centralized questions. They talk, and then they text back the answers. And they can, you can do groups all over the country, and you can see how each other is talking about it. So it's a combination of technology and face-to-face -face discourse. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, so I think I encourage you to think creatively about ways to use technology and certainly to enhance social connectivity. Thank you. Question? Yes, sir. Um, 
Dr. Thomas, I was just looking at the website and looking at the types of colleges and universities involved, and I noticed that there are no for-profit colleges or institutions on there. Right. Um, I just read Suzanne Mettler's book, Degree of Inequality, where she was um, really chastising the for-profit schools for saddling students with debt, and then they end up without the degree, and so forth and so on. Will your institute look at that civic engagement for for-profits to see what the evidence might suggest? To my knowledge, and I, I could be wrong about this, they don't participate in the National Student Clearinghouse. I don't believe they give their data. And therefore, there's no repository of their enrollment lists. And if I don't have a database, I can't do it. So what that would mean is that they either have to get together and form a database, or they have to give me their enrollment list. I do not have any names of your students. I don't want them. I, I, I'm a privacy junkie. And so I'd be very reluctant to receive a whole bunch of enrollment lists. That said, I get asked this question a lot, and it is under consideration. I think it needs to be done. Their graduation rates are atrocious. and um, but. I don't know whether I don't know whether we are going to be able to do it easily. So I'm I'm going to come back to you with that answer in a while. Hey, John, we have time for one more quick question. Actually, we have. Uh, don't we have till eleven? No, uh, yeah, we have. We're almost up, right? Sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Latricia Moore from uh, the Panhandle, uh, North Florida, Chipola College. I have a quick question. I teach sociology and psychology at the college, and I was sharing with Miss Elizabeth from Gulf Coast uh, within the Panhandle, cross dip disciplines as we are not civically engaged, but we want to be. How do we get students engaged from cross disciplines, and if it's not a part of their gen ed, our requirements for their AA degree. How do we get academic advisors? Because I am, as faculty, that is a part of my um, responsibility as well. Getting academic advisors, student affairs, and other faculty within those disciplines, how do we get them engaged in terms of uh, getting, getting more civic and or political sciences, credit hours, and or such? So I think, Dr. Newsom, specifically to you, how, how would we, or your recommendations for that? It's good to see you, it's good to see you again. Um, first off, I would say don't try to make students take classes that they don't want to take, that we need to build it in the inside out. And Archie, yesterday, I think you said about building Miami-Dade from inside out, and that's what SBC is doing, and that's where we've seen a lot of success. So bring civic engagement to every single class and allow faculty to find the core, the, find the activity that meets their teaching style or their, you know, their, what their course objectives are. So that's one piece. So make sure that we share resources. So we have uh, faculty uh, leads on our campuses and we have institutional uh, commitment to allowing for individuals to explore that, right? Because that's the one piece. The piece that you just said about academic, academic advising is a piece that SPC is really exploring right now, which is that civic engagement speaks to student success. Okay, students that participate in coursework, and we know this from reading all the literature, and that's why in part you do it, is because it's a good thing to do, it feels good, it's good for the student, but also make sure the student completes the course, completes the degree, and graduates. It goes to all of those pieces, and those are all performance-based indicators from the state. So academic advising, student services, student affairs, whatever you call it in your institution, um, are starting to understand and embrace their role with the faculty as a collaborative, that the service learning and engagement is not just an in-class or out-of-class activity, it's part of the experience. So the only thing that I can say that we're, that I'm really, pr I'm, I'm proud of a lot of things that we do at SBC, but one of the things I'm most proud of is that we're taking the two-lane model, right, which is what Senator Graham talked about, and building it into the very experience of the college so that no matter who you are and what discipline you're in, you're going to touch service. And that service for the academic advisor and the student 
uh, affairs individual is going to show that it creates success, and that's what we're all there for. So it's not a hard sell. Um, sometimes it's just the data, and it's connecting the data of civic engagement, which those measurement tools were just developing, right, and connecting it to the student success data, and then coming out. The preliminary information has come out that there's a, it does a whole lot to move student success. You don't need one. I don't need one either. We're good. good. Um, just to follow up with that, you're, you're exactly right. Because in, in a rural community setting, the climate and the, the traditional mindedness, it's different from your urban and suburban areas. So in a rural setting, and I'm getting a nod back here. I know Elizabeth is saying, yes, yes. You know, it, it's a challenge for us. And, and presents those barriers for us. So I'm glad you said that. Because we want to... Um, bring that connection, even as a practicing sociologist and or anthropologist or what have you, psychologist, we want to thread that and connect our students and empower them that even if you're not majoring in political science, even if you are a sociology major, um, within those six hours of academic advising, but within those six hours of social science that they can take, it could be any six hours, can political science be one? Right, right. Okay, or, you know or, what I'm saying? Or the course that they're taking or can whatever. build it into them. Because we have math Correct. classes at SVC that are teaching, that right. have, a, have a tutoring, so the math students go and tutor right. the low-income students that aren't performing well in math tests. Right. I mean, yes. that's civic engagement. Right, uh, right. The, and I'm, I'm going to pass it over so Nancy can speak, but I just want to make sure that you also remember that civic engagement is not far away from career readiness at all. Right. Mm -hmm. it's, it's training to be engaged. It's networking. It's all those essential components of career readiness. So yes. the idea that they're mutually exclusive, they're like this. Right. And we just have to be able to, if we don't have institutional leaders, we need to bring that back to them and show them that correlation. Right. So I'm going to say something that is probably going to be met with a, <gasps> and that is the, it, community engagement is not necessary all the time. I didn't hear it. <gasps> I, think it's, I think it's great. I think there are a lot of faculty members who just, they just don't know what to do. And what I'm talking about happens in the walls of a classroom. And I defy you, come up to me afterwards and tell me one discipline, name one, that doesn't have a component that is what I would call a public relevance. Yeah. Every discipline has some public relevance. And so what we're talking about is teaching the students the public relevance of all of the, all of the disciplines or whatever they study or just, they just faculty need to, to build it in. And so for some faculty, engagement in the community is going to be easy, it's natural, they're going to get it. For others, it's going to be, okay, I'm going to take a math class and I'm going to teach my students how to use some of the databases out there that politicians are using to make their case for things. Or engineers, I, I'm, we're going to put up a bridge. Have we really thought about the implications in the surrounding community? You know, what are the implications? I, I, I talked to a faculty member once who was having his students go in and building heating systems in habitat homes. And I said, what did you explain about the habitat homes to the students? And he said, he said nothing. It has nothing to do with what I do. And I thought, ay, ay, ay. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, perhaps we should end on ay, ay, ay. 